Okay, so basically yeah. the, the 80s and the 90s were primarily, especially the, you know, until the mid 90s, it was about women's issues, it was about working in various kinds of um, materials which differed, completely left canvas or, you know, acrylic, oil on canvas, went on to paper-based uh, uh, mediums. It had a lot to do with my own research also mm -hmm. because I was mm -hmm. looking at... Um, I was looking at how the independence movement uh, really influenced art making in the subcontinent and that the freedom movement rejected oil on canvas as uh, the colonial medium and how you had, you know, place people like Chukhtai or you had people in um, the Bengal schools really going over entirely to water-based and paper mediums because they felt that was the tradition of the subcontinent. And um, the more I read about it, the more interested I became. I was also looking at, because my teaching continued side by side, and I'd also gone off to do my master's at, um, at RISD, a lot of my work started centering on materials that were less, how should I say, masculine <laughs> than oil. Um, and more to do with layered work, with going back to collage, which I used to enjoy very much, um, using delicate paper, uh, handmade paper, using um, charcoal, uh, using pure pigment, powdered pigment. So the medium really started becoming the message in a certain way. Um, and that has more or less continued until present with long gaps in between when I focused more on curating mm -hmm. and on mm -hmm. writing and on really um, my art education um, career. So it's been, um, it's been a career in which there has been art making at you know, one point becoming very, very strong and very passionate and completely engaging me. At the time, it's been the curating that's, you know, totally taken me over. For years and years and years, I worked, um, you know, with the Rotas Gallery in Islamabad first, with Naim Pasha, uh, whose office, the architect's office, was our site. We also, those were the years of Zia, and we couldn't show a lot of work in government galleries. There weren't many, many private mm -hmm. galleries. So that was one of the reasons of starting a space in which you could be independent, in which you would encourage artists whose work otherwise would never get a showing. Uh, so art making, curating, and of course teaching sort of got intertwined to the degree that I didn't know very occasionally which became more important and which took a back seat. I was happy that because of my teaching, I was able to give artists who were upcoming the kind of opportunity perhaps, which they would not have got otherwise. One other thing was, of course, that we had such good work happening and nobody would write about it. And I was no writer. But I was forced to write. I was forced to write because I hated the stuff that, you know, the next morning after an exhibition would appear in the newspaper, you know. Everybody was a Maya Nas Fankar and, you know, beautiful works in colorful filana, you know. So it was really out of extreme frustration that I started writing also. So you really managed, so so you really managed so to balance so many different, different, aspects, so many different of aspects of it. I tried and they take priorities at different times, you know. Um, I thought that there was a lot of very interesting thing happening in the last 15 years, for example. Mm. And mm. so it deserved a lot of attention and deserved a lot of writing. Exhibitions disappear, as you know, into thin air. And there's nothing left except perhaps a document. Yeah. And the document is a catalog. A document is a book. So therefore, um, I tried very hard to make sure that um, I could participate in doing that. Therefore, the book on women artists. It really came out because I felt there was a tribute required mm. to mm. the you know, the, the great contribution made by women teachers 
made by the early practitioners, people like Zubaydah Agha and Naseem Ghazi and Anna Molka Ahmed and Novera Ahmed. So it was really, um, it was an attempt to, to draw those figures into the limelight and I did it sort of chapter-wise, decade-wise and then ending up with the young talent. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. if I would write the book again, I'd focus much more on the women of today. Um, but at that time, I had to kind of stop it at 2000. So uh, I think the last 20 years have been some of the most exciting years. But of course, they've also drawn. But of course, on they've also drawn on the artists of the past. The artists so of the past. Really and so it is really important. That you also yes. spoke about. You also spoke about. I actually wanted. I actually uh, wanted to oh, ask sorry, you. Ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just said, and because the book was based on interviews, so I had the women's voices coming through. Yeah. They could speak about their. Work they could speak about their work in their own world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always best. It's always I actually best. wanted to ask. I actually you wanted to ask you a little bit about, about your role as an activist as well, in the seventies as well, and the eighties. Because I understand. Because I understand that women artists were leading this whole, leading um, battalion. This whole um, battalion. Well, my male friends got a bit annoyed with me, <laughs> and they said, "You know, our baat koi nahi karta. You know, what's going on?" Um, but I said, "You know, you've had two thousand years of attention." Okay. So it's time that, you know, women came into the limelight and we really talked about their work. I didn't really separate um, my, uh, my focus on women artists from the activism. Um, the 70s, to begin with, you know, when was the turmoil in 71 and so on, was something that, well, it broke a lot of hearts to have, you know, uh, part company with some of the great people who we admired, people like Zeno Labadeen and, you know, the artists from the other wing who did influence art making in this wing uh, of Pakistan. So, um, but then they, there came the great blossoming and patronage, which happened from 72 to 77. So then, and that is the time when we were working with a lot with, um, with television and the performing arts. And then came 77 and the axe fell. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. axe, which was the military dictatorship, the most savage that we have ever seen. Um, and therefore, once activism came about as a connection between lawyers, between writers, between women poets, between women of theater, of dance, all of these women who felt strongly that they needed to protest, that they needed to stand up to the dictator and his, you know, huge, huge infrastructure. And it was dangerous. It was terribly, terribly dangerous. And the political parties had been silenced and decimated. Mm. And therefore, it was really the women who spoke up for dissent. And women artists were among them. So we took, we took chances. Um, we took chances and I think that the, our male friends who were there with us, uh, also in their work, you see a reflection of what is happening. But when we got together one day at the time of the national exhibition in my house, and we decided we were going to put our names to a document, which was the manifesto of the women artists of Pakistan. It was a very deliberate act. We couldn't make that manifesto public. We would have got into trouble. But when we signed it, 14, 15 of us, it kind of changed our attitude to our own work. We realized we had to we had to think very much about the meaning of what we were doing. And it did alter our practices. Lala Rukh and myself were the two people who drafted the manifesto, but we read it out to the women who were present. And uh, they gladly put their name to it. That has become a very interesting document because it's been reprinted now, uh, including in this book, which is called a hundred international manifestos. Why are we artists? Uh, it's um, it's part of that. So um, 
that was that was our activism and it continues it continues until today things are not any better you wake up in the morning and you read terrible incidents of violence against women violence against children you realize that women are still deprived of their basic rights in spite of, in spite of a lot of lip service so i think that um we can need to continue to focus on women's issues and of course whether it's a woman artist or a poet or a writer uh, it's through their work that they draw your attention to these issues it's true and really signing true, a document, really that's, signing legal, a document legal, that's legal makes everything so, makes much, everything more so much more serious in a sense and when you put yourself yes. out there and when you put there, yourself you really out there, there you really cause. take it on as a cause Also, a few people also a few people have also, mentioned that there's an echo when I speak. I'm afraid okay. we're not sure. I'm afraid we're so not we're sure. So we're just going to ignore it for a while. <laughs> yeah, I can I can hear you perfectly well. Okay, so and that's, that's what's okay, and that's what's me. most important to me. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, but that's really interesting. Yeah, but that's really interesting. And what you're saying, what you're saying about today's world, world is, so is, so well. is so correct as well. In that it is in up that to it is up to female and artists, artists and to women to leaders to really step up, really step up and take flag the forward. flag forward and as they continue to and as they continue the to do with the Orat March that happens mm-hmm. every year that happens every year mm-hmm. and I think it's for which everybody gets a lot of we get a lot of flag for that. Yeah, I know. Of course. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I suppose like your I suppose like your male friends at the time meant today are still today are still yeah no but. No but this time I was very happy to see that there were a lot of men in the Orat march also mm-hmm. because I believe mm-hmm. it has it has to be a partnership agreed uh, women need agreed. Men, women need the men the strong men who will walk with them and they will walk that long walk and be their supporters you know we we need all of those men who will be there by our side and believe in what we are saying it's true it's true we need to all stand in solidarity we need to all stand in solidarity one another, one another. <laughs> Well, coming, you know, well, sort of coming through, you know, that, sort of through I that, I wanted to chat a little bit more, about, bit more about the choose book, book about that earlier. you spoke about earlier. The artist that you chose. The artist that you chose. How did you make that? Selection? How did you make that selection? Um, the women artist book, or the know, women artist book. Well, the, the women book. artist book. Well, basically, I simply, I mean, I had lived a lot of that history. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I of course, as a child, I knew. people like Anna Molka Ahmed or Zubeda Agha uh, as a young student i saw Novera Ahmed and admired her the great sculptor from bengal uh, so in a in a sense it was my upbringing and then because i was selecting decades mm. i did a little bit of research and saw which exhibitions took place during that those decades but i also connected the decades to the social and political events that marked each decade as interesting that they fell very neatly 47 onwards it fell very neatly into important people marking a decade and uh, then i came to my own age group and i looked around and i saw the important artists um and of course i had to be very selective because there was doing i was doing interviews and but i tried to make sure that they were artists you know not all just the ones in lahore around me but i traveled a bit and i met people from different places um and tried to make it diverse and then came to the younger artists mm. some of whom mm. i had been very privileged to teach um i looked at some of them and there too i tried to I try to make sure that it was not just one kind of practitioner that they should have diverse voices in the in their practice. So you know whether it was you know Shazia Sikandar or Dalha or whatever that they were people who were very different. Ruby Chishti, not many sculptors because at that time we didn't have that many sculptors. It's a different situation right now. So try to make it as representation as possible. um and certain themes of course start emerging when you do in so many interviews you do realize that very often um these were women who were single parents or who were who had not married um very often a father played a very important role uh in a in a woman's life a father's encouragement 
and so on. So there were these themes that, that appear in the book. Um, I think it's time to write another book on women artists of Pakistan um, because there's such tremendous uh, women practitioners today. Uh, so maybe somebody else will do it. Don't say that. I think you should do it. I think you should do it. No, no. I think that there's this now. What what is very encouraging now is the number of women who are writing. Yes. You know, when I started, yes. it was. Um, I really started, as I told you, in frustration because there was not enough written. But I'm delighted now when I see that there are lots of new curators and they are writing and the writing is of caliber. I have never claimed to be a scholar because I'm not. I was trained as a hands-on person. But now I see scholars who are coming into the field and doing very well with their writing and their curating. So to me, it's, it's tremendously encouraging. It's what tremendously do you think caused cause that shift? I think the fact that it's time, I think, to play great tribute to teachers and to the fact that a few art institutions in Pakistan have produced such a wave of internationally and nationally recognized artists. And it was because the early women artists were more educators uh, and therefore they contributed. I think that institutions like the National College of Arts have contributed immensely. And you look at now, of course, you look at the Beacon House National University, the Indus Valley School of um, Art and Architecture in Karachi, uh, look at what they have done in recent years, Karachi University and so on. So I think that the dynamism which you find today in the Pakistani scene, if you like, comes from the fact that practicing artists have also been teachers. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is a very rare thing in the world. I mean, I've done a lot of traveling and I find that the big stars um, in the art world don't teach. I mean, they go and give the occasional lecture, but they don't do back-breaking work, which is in the studio teaching day after day, week after week, month after month. And that you know, commitment. Had, and you know, we've had I've had Kadim Ali, had Kadim Ali on this conversation, and he spoke so and he much, spoke about, so his much about his mentors, who were Imran Qureshi, Rashid Rana, yeah. artists who yeah. really, artists who really excel, but who continue, yeah. continue to teach. Yeah, yeah. I think that has been uh, at the base of this great flowering and blossoming. Um, if you look at the circumstances under which people work. If you see the very difficult struggle that has been there for most of the artists, um, they were not born with silver spoons in their mouths. Mm -hmm. They have worked and they stretch, you know, from Koita to Hunza to, you know, Hyderabad, etc. So it's not entirely city based. It's not exactly urban. They have come from very far fung places. And yes, they have found good teachers and the mentoring they received gave them the faith in themselves. Um, and that is really the basis of a very dynamic art movement, which is there in Pakistan. It's very true. It's and very you true. yourself, and you been yourself have been at the very backbone of, of two of those remarkable institutions. The NCA and the NCA. NCA. I've enjoyed and the BNU. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. I've had a ball. I I've had a ball. Ask, <laughs> I want to ask you about philosophy. your teaching philosophy. Um, you know, I don't have inverted commas a philosophy, yeah. except yeah. that I'm very curious about people. And I'm interested in people finding their own voice. So I, ha I had wonderful teachers, and I remember that one of my teachers, um, you know, he said to me, this is in England, he said, always sugar the pill. Mm -hmm. So, and I've kept that as something that I never or I refrain from giving my own solutions to artists who I mentor. I try very hard to keep asking them questions so that they manage to negotiate their own way to where they want to go. Um, and it's very wonderful if you're a witness to see that moment in which a person suddenly finds 
away, you know, and that has happened to me so many times in my career in which I've prodded people, a remark here, a possible, you know, suggestion there. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> just somebody has done something crazy and they're looking towards you to say, you know, am I, is this madness or is this me? To be able to stand there and just say, you know, I think, I think you made a breakthrough. That's it. Uh, so I think that the philosophy has really been to allow people to find them, you know, find their own way. Um, I never, never attempted or believed that I had any solutions to anybody's um, ways of making art. Um, that's, you know, that's not the way I was taught. Uh, and that's, I think, the advantage if you've done art education mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. opposed to doing, you know, pure painting or that you, you do know what the education process is. And it is not about providing answers, but only to keep asking questions. And that's true, especially and that's since, true, artists, especially since school school artists in school are preparing for, for their entire life and journey. So eventually, mm -hmm. so eventually they're going to need to be able to figure out themselves. Yeah. And you yeah, need to absolutely. provide and you need to provide them the tools with which, they can, with which they can do that then. And trust true. in themselves. And trust in themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you, have any stories Do you have any that stories have stayed that have stayed with you? Stayed with any you. Moments, any, any moments, any particular students? Because I know not because only I know have you not only thought, have you at, thought these um, at these two institutions, but you've had numerous but you've had numerous lectures and workshops with students and, with children. Students and children. Yes, I. Um, you know, there are innumerable stories, and sometimes one uh, one refrains because. They can be embarrassing for the person who we talk, but but um, I the wonderful thing is to be sometimes in a place where a person is vulnerable, and if you can support them simply by being there. I mean that has happened to me by you know I know of um, artists who have become teachers, and because they are very different in the way they approach their teaching or the way they produce their art meeting that they have not quite fitted in to the institution where they are uh, and very often targeted because they are different from everybody else. So it's been my task sometimes to arrive unannounced in an institution and to say, you know, I just want to look around. And of course, everybody says, oh, wonderful, this, that, and the other. And then to have uh, the naughty um, idea to really, really praise the person who everybody thinks is totally bad, you know. And then suddenly to find that you, because of the weight of your opinion for whatever, however you give it, um, has made a difference to that person's position where they are. And I think that that is because this is a society that prefers compromise, that prefers safety, that prefers to constantly repeat what is there in history and discourages investigation, new pathways, new ideas. So when it's been possible to do that, um, I have tried to do, play that role of the instigator, if you like. Um, I call it troubleshooting. That's when one has been that's able to the most that. important role. It is the catalyst. It, the catalyst. It, it it didn't arrive on me. I earned it. Very very tough in my days as a young teacher. At that time, the only female teacher in NCA. Okay, when I started teaching in seventy, the other teachers. I was the only female. And you know, without naming names, I had a pretty tough time with my male colleagues who thought, you know, I was this frivolous female who'd come from somewhere or the other. And they didn't like much of the way that I thought. Mm. Um, I was mm. keen on introducing new materials. I was interested in totally changing the setup in the studio. Um, I introduced collage, for example, as a medium. And everybody thought, you know, what is this rubbish sort of thing, until the work started appearing. Um, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. 
And when, after setting up, you know, particular kind of still life, and the works that came were like amazing. And that's when my male colleagues started saying, mm, yeah. So, and that's when I would get, on occasion, one of my teachers who had been like, what is this young woman up to, would come along to me and say, okay, Salima, so set up one of your provocative still lives. <laughs> to me, that was a real medal to be told I could, I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do. I think that people don't realize that the history of art education in this, in this country has been very, very tough. Mm -hmm. At one time, mm -hmm. the curriculum at NCA was a kind of thing that, okay, you did one thesis painting, full stop, and you were judged on that. It was a battle that I fought, and Zahura Laklaak was my champion in that also. And we said, no, it should be a body of work. But we had to fight the bureaucracy. Okay? And nobody likes change. And nobody likes change. No. They all said, oh, it has to be an oil on canvas. Mm -hmm. And when we questioned that and said, why? It was like, but it's always been oil on canvas. Wow. To wow. say, why? So, you know, these have been battles that have been fought over 30, 35 years. Today, you know, you have digital work. You have work which is mixed media. You have, you have every kind of art making. But it's been a very long journey. And, um, you know, young artists simply, simply sometimes don't know because that history is yet to be written. Exactly. <laughs> so, they only, exactly. See, things they they only see things as they are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they're lucky to have had, well, they're you, lucky as to have had you as a champion. And there were others in my band for Brebbles. Sure. <laughs> I yeah. wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the curating that, that you've been doing, and mm -hmm. I think perhaps and I think perhaps we could start with the show in New York, which is mm -hmm. now I think which is now I think eleven really years old, old but really still impact. had such an impact. Yeah, that uh, that was a privilege, and it happened out of the blue. Um, I was, so it was invited at the Asia, to. So it was at the Asia Society. Yeah, uh, I was invited to Asia Society, and uh, so. Um, uh, one of the curators there said to me that, you know, we, we are thinking about um, an exhibition from a a Pakistan. We've had a very successful exhibition from India. And um, so would you like to give us a presentation? So I did that. Um, I mean, she had warned me ahead of time. So I, um, I did a presentation on what I thought uh, could be the, the thrust of the exhibition a great deal on today, here and now, um, because I felt that that was, you know, that was something that would amaze uh, New Yorkers, the diversity of what was happening right then, um, but also base it on the shoulders of um, somebody like Zahura Laklaak, who covers the bridge between the modern and the contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, they liked my presentation a great deal. And they immediately set a date, which was, you know, like 18 months, which was, you know, very short, really, for a museum show. Uh, but I took up the challenge, and I knew that um, there was enough happening in Pakistan uh, to really to be able to count on many of the artists. It helps when you have been curating in Pakistan. You know, the what curating at Rotas Gallery, being a teacher, um, being a friend to artists, that helps you because mm -hmm. they you know, you're you. not, you're not, they trust you. Yeah, and, and sort of, and very quickly um, the theme started appearing. And um, so it, it really was something in which wonderful work was shown. Um, some artists were well known already, um, some were not. Uh, and somewhere at the cusp of, you know, becoming known. So it was wonderful to be able to show Rashid Rana, who was already known, um, together with Ali Raza, who was not, uh, with, you know, people who were some among my favorites, like Anwar Said, and also have, you know, something really dramatic, like Huma Mulji's, mm -hmm. you know, Buffalo mm -hmm. atop um, that, and then some wonderful uh, video work by Bani Abidi. 
So, I mean, it, it was, and of course, Imran did us proud by doing work, which was climbed up the staircase and so on. I mean, it was, to my mind, even though we had to make a lot of compromises in terms of our budget, we simply didn't have, there were many works that I would like to have borrowed, but they were too far away across the world and we couldn't get them over. Um, but still, I think in spite of many, many constraints, uh, we were happy with the show. I think the artists were happy with the show, and I think New York was happy with the show. I think so. I think and how so. did you think of and the how title, did you think of the Hanging title, Fire? Hanging Fire? <laughs> That's really funny, <laughs> because we couldn't think of a title. I thought of a title, and then um, I was told, no, no, it's too similar to what the Indian show was, and this. So we were sitting having breakfast one morning, and um, um, so you know, somebody asked me, so you know, do you have a title yet? So I said, no, you know, it's still hanging fire. And then my host stopped and said, that's your title, hanging fire. <laughs> and so it was just, you know, it came out of a, a breakfast conversation. A breakthrough you, moment. Like. A breakthrough moment. It was Melissa Chu and her husband who were giving me breakfast. Yeah. And uh, so she said, that's the title. Yeah, yeah, that's the title, hanging it's a fire. Great title. It's yeah. a great title. And you were 15 yeah. artists, And you were 15 right? artists, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. It's half really women, half men. Really yeah. <laughs> yeah. Important to have that balance. Important to always, have that I balance think. always, I think. Yes, 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 yes. I don't want to be considered somebody who only shows women artists. I'm kind to the men also. Occasionally, when they occasionally, deserve it. when they deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> and tell me, what was the reception, tell me, what was like, the reception to like to this show? Were you well, proud, we of, how it, were you proud of how it turned out? Yes, and we got very good press, which I was very happy about. Um, mind you, because um, there's, there's some sort of people who are expecting something very stereotypical to come out of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. You know, I was asked mm -hmm. questions like, so where's the calligraphy? Or I was asked questions like, you know, there are all this uh, terrorism in Pakistan and there's blum blast and blah, 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 and where is that? So, you know, you have to sort of take people through the process of how work happens mm -hmm. and also there mm -hmm. was there was a lot of political comment in in the work but it was layered it was subtle and it had to be unpacked and i think sometimes you know uh, somebody who's writing or needling you they want something very overt mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. the artist and i think that is something that you don't want from pakistani art I think what we have seen over these years is the subtlety of it. I mean, exactly. if you look at Rashid exactly. Rana's red carpet, I mean, there you have your political comment, right there, you know. So don't look at what it appears to be, which is, of course, what, what, what Rashid is talking about, that appearances are, you know, Deceit. they are something, that, yeah, so de deceitful, deceiving. So, you know, go close, unwrap it, unpack it, look at it carefully. And, I mean, look at the work of um, Imran in that show also. The humor in which he's talking about, you know, um, people who apparently look like would-be uh, Taliban. Mm -hmm. And they're the gentlest mm -hmm. of creatures, you know, who are blowing bubbles, um, you know, through a sort of pipe. And so on and so forth. Or if you look at the work of yeah. Naisa, and uh, what it was, or, or, or Pfizer for that matter. I mean, that was work which was full of a lot of commentary. But it's not, you know, it's not an, a poster. It is, it is poetry. Exactly. And therefore, exactly. you know, it's, the message comes through its lyricism. And so it's longer lasting, you know. Times change, but the work will remain potent. Of course, and it's nuanced. Of course, course like and it's nuanced. Just like people here, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. like anywhere. Yeah, yeah, like anywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to ask you, now, I wanted about to ask recent you now about a recent show that you've done, which was then held at, the, first then held at the first festival, and that also mm -hmm. brings and that also to brings me to discussing a great legacy that you've, you've been upholding with the Fairs Foundation and the Fairs Festival. Would you be mm -hmm. able to chat? A little Would you be bit able to chat a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, you know, this year at the Fairs uh, Festival, it was um, the 400th anniversary of Guru Nanak, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. Lahore being where it is. And uh, 
Kartarpur opening, it was too important an event to ignore. Also because of Fez's legacy of peace, peace between neighbors, we felt it was terribly important to mark it uh, with um, the diversity that is there in our history and in our culture. So we looked at, you know, uh, Sikh art, Sikh painting, and we put it um, out there for um, they were mostly reproductions, but there was some contemporary work that we were able to tap. Um, and we had these wonderful banners, which had um, which had quotations from Guru Nanak, which were hanging down from the ceiling, and you could read it in Gurmukhi or you could read it in Shamukhi. And the fact that um, there was, we were able to have a presentation uh, of readings from Guru Nanak. Uh, we felt that we had done um, our work as marking an important date, but also showing contemporary and traditional work. Mm. Uh, mm. I think that Fez's legacy is about that. It's about acknowledging that you are heirs to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of culture, which goes across the visual arts, goes across music, goes across poetry, goes across filmmaking, um, performing arts, theater, which is what we do at the Fairs Festival. But it's also very much, very much to do about um, Fairs being a man of peace. And I think if there's something that I learned at a very young age, which was not to be carried away when the world seems to be wrapped in hatred, but to always speak out as almost as a mission, speak out about the fact that humankind cannot afford war. War is a negation of humanism. And Fez was a man of humanity, of great humanism. His poetry is totally imbued with it. Um, and I think it's at the core of all values. Humanism is at the core of all values. Therefore, that's my legacy. And if there's anything that um, I can do through my work, through other people's art making, through my teaching, through my troubleshooting. Uh, it said human beings are important, you know. Those are very, very wise Those words. Those are very, very wise words. <laughs> no, and it's a wonderful, I don't know about and that. It's a wonderful it's a way of looking well. at the so world important. as well. It's so important. And just on a personal and level, just on a personal when, we're level so, when we're all so sort of, it's so easy, of, to, fly yeah, it's so easy to fly off the handle. And completely tear apart and completely relationships. Tear apart relationships. You need to remember that, you the, need world to remember that the world doesn't like always that. work like that. No, no. How have people responded? How have people the responded car? to the fairs car that you've created? Um, you've it's a very created? it's a it's a very modest effort. It's just that you know my father had a very nomadic life, um, and there was whatever we will we could get together to save by my mother, uh, and she always said, you know, this doesn't belong to us. You know, whether it was his papers, his photographs, his manuscripts, um, his clothes. You say, you know, this belongs to the nation. Mm. Uh, well, the nation um, was too busy doing other things. So um, we just were offered this space um, by uh, a person, a friend, who also was an admirer of Fez and said, you know, would you like to use this small space? It's a small house, which is in Model Town, where we live. And so we set it up as a space, which is in a space where you can perform, you can have music, you can have dance. Uh, can do you know very small readings and so on, but it also houses his archives, and um, so it's really become a place where people come um, because it's not a huge place, but it's like a little museum where they have you have his letters on display, a few I'm things, wonderful. articles that he used, you know, a little medal here, his pen there, etc. Uh, they can see that they can see all his photographs throughout his life. And there's also a space for people to do rehearsals, to have small meetings, music lessons going on, yoga lessons going on, 
um, you know, people meet, do this kind this, that. And the book, book launches, discussions on, on poetry, on filmmaking, etc. So all the things that actually Fez was interested in. Um, we, we operate on a shoe ring, or shoe string, because Fez didn't leave a great deal of money and his kids have not been good at earning much. So we, we, we really depend on friends and patrons who can help us. Now, of course, because of COVID-19, uh, it's closed. So suddenly, all our classes and so on have been discontinued. But now we're getting back to going online. Yesterday, we had a wonderful lecture by Dr. Arfa Sayeda on the poetry of Ghalib. And we are now launching a lot of programs online. So I hope we'll get our friends back and our patrons, uh, and people will contribute to making sure that we keep going um, and we manage. Next four or five months, we won't be able to be, invite people there, but in another two or three months, all his work will go online. Oh, the fantastic. archives will that go online. Fantastic. Yeah, they've been digitized and they'll all go online. So all that will be available. Wow. Um, what a gift so we you're do giving. what we can. Gift you're giving everybody. <laughs> Fez was a gift to all of us, so we're just making sure everybody has a slice of him, if you like. I hope we're also digitizing, I hope we're also all, of digitizing all of your work well. and writings as well. And your own archives. Ah. And your own archives. <laughs> well, part of it, as you know, have gone to the Asian Art yes. Archives. They have yes. been you know, very kind and very supportive. Um, there's a lot more, uh, which, you know, I'm very happy that Dr. Samina Iqbal is assisting me and slowly... She, you know, she comes and she burrows around in the place and she finds wonderful, a new bit of treasure. Wonderful. And then she says, oh, this, we found this. And so on and so forth. So I'm very grateful for people who are interested enough to start researching. Um, Asad Hai, who worked with me in Rotas 2, the gallery, um, he, he's um, been my absolute so kind of go-to person. Um, I actually don't look after my archives at all. He's the person who if somebody says, oh, can I have three pieces of your work like you asked? Um, I'll say, oh, please ask Asad. I know Asad's so, been amazing. Um, I know Asad's been amazing. <laughs> yeah, Thank yeah, you, absolutely. Asad. Thank you, Asad. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky that um, I don't have to really do some of these things, which I would not have the capacity to do at my age. But there are people who are in my arms and uh, can help me. I mean, you've created such a wonderful I mean, you've structure created such already, a wonderful the path structure forward already, so and the path us. forward for so many of us. I also have very supportive children who were, who managed, you know, without their mother making them, you know, food and popping into their mouths, and so they, um, you know, they are the ones who now tell me what I have to like. Mira, I'm using her phone uh, to talk to you because, of course, I didn't have Instagram, and um, so you know, having. Having children who actually are close to you and around you uh, is a tremendous asset. Yeah, it's a blessing. Uh, because, yeah, it's a blessing. Yes, that it is. So, you know, I think family that is close-knit is sometimes, um, you know, something that, that makes you, um, makes you, helps you survive, yeah. helps you survive. Yeah. Shall we look at some Shall questions? we look at some questions? I want to continue this I want to continue this conversation so these questions, will be, so questions will be good to, to chat about uh, and sort sure. of chat about as well. Yes, please do. Okay, lovely. Okay, lovely. Uh, so here's when Mrs. Uh, so here's when Mrs. Hashmi, what, role, what role, role did your father play in your taking up fine arts, if any? If any. Um I think both my parents um were um were encouraging in the sense when my mother noticed that I used to like to draw, she made sure that there were always colored pencils. She made sure at every birthday I would get a paint box. Um, my father was, you know, it's very few, people, very few people know this, but when he was in jail, he sent for a paint box also. And I remember that he had a notebook and he drew a lot of faces and so on. And it somehow disappeared when he came back from jail. I never saw it again, never found it again. So because he had a lot of friends who were very, you know, who were artists, I mean, he had friends who were musicians, et cetera, et cetera, also. Um, so it was always clear that both my sister and myself could really take up any career that we wanted to. There was never any pressure to be a doctor or whatever. Um, I think that 
we were lucky that way. Um, and uh, so my, my mother was always much more vocal and said, you know, I mean, I knew I was interested in politics. I knew I was interested in art. Um, and so I went to Lahore College where they had the fine arts department. By that time, NCA had become NCA from Mayo School. It had a new principal, Professor Sponnenberg, who was a friend of my parents. And my parents said, here is a dynamic person who will totally transform that sleepy place. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky. Mm -hmm. I went there and there were wonderful teachers. Um, who really, really, who drew me out from being a very shy, introverted, not a word coming out of my mouth child, to somebody who is much more confident. And um, it was NCA, really, uh, and those remarkable teachers that I had. Um, so, And my father was encouraging all the time, but my mother even more so. Uh, because while he would say, you know, do what you like, my mother would actually provide you know, the stuff that goes with it. Okay, you know, you need, you need this, this, this. Okay, you're going to have this. And then, of course, when I was wanting to go abroad to study, um, my mother was very frank. She said, okay, we saved up so much money. This is either for your marriage or for your education, which do you want? Education, thank you. I'll never get married to anybody who wants money. So I was also smart enough to find a person who didn't want me to bring a, being a jahez, to bring a dowry. <laughs> how did you and your husband meet? How did you meet? and your husband meet? It was through theater, right? It was theater, It's a great, right? great big cliche. Yes, we acted opposite one another in a play. You know, yes, you did. And, yes, you did. Uh, but it was not love at first sight. That much I can tell you. We were pals, and actually, we acted in three plays together. Oh. And by that time, it was time oh. for me to go to England, and um, so it looked as though you know, it would be it would be nice to um, you know make it a permanent. But then I went off to England, but he also came to Royal Academy of Dramatic Art to Drada for a he year. He followed you. He followed you. Very yes, romantic. he followed me. Very romantic. And uh, my parents had already left for England, so, but we went about it in a very traditional way. His mother went to my grandmother, asked for the rishta, my grandmother, and having no idea that we knew one another, sort of sent a message to my father and said, you know, looks like a nice boy. And uh, so my father said, okay. So the family thought it was all very traditional, but we knew otherwise. But you had had your secret. But you had had your secret. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so here's another question. So here's another question. Mm -hmm. Which of your own pieces, which of your own pieces, which of your own artworks, or actually any work of yours, have mm -hmm. you been most proud of? Have you been most proud of? Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that's a tough mm -hmm. one. <laughs> I think at different times, a work uh, means a great deal because it kind of, you kind of turn a corner or you do something a bit different. Um, and that, that happened a couple of times. Um, in 89, I did a series when I came back from, um, from RISD, which were, it was, they, they were works to do with my growing up, but also the turmoil uh, in Pakistan. So there were two major works that were kind of sister works. One of them then was destroyed in a fire in Islamabad, which was very sad. Oh, no. uh, it went to a collector. She was, um, she was a wonderful person. Her house was attacked by a mob and they burnt the house down and my painting went with it. But this is traumatic. The other, so traumatic. Yes. So, you know, that's what extremism does. It destroys art. Was she all right? And, Was um, she all right? Yeah, yeah. They weren't in the house at that time. Oh, thank goodness. And thank the, goodness. Other, the other was bought by uh, an American journalist who worked in um, Afghanistan. And uh, she was killed in a helicopter crash in, in Afghanistan. And the work is with her daughter uh, in the U.S., uh, so this is this, these were two works that I was very proud of, uh, and in fact she had more works of mine which, which are very very nice. Um, there were works that I did at RISD, 
one of which I love, which is actually a print. Um, I have that. Um, there's a work that I did in 92 called A Poem for Zena, which was um, a series of works which was um, on violence against women. And it was a woman called Zainab who was brutalized by her husband, who happened to be a, a Malvi. Um, and it was beyond comprehension what he did to her. And somehow I was so traumatized by that, uh, that it led to a series of works, um, in which I actually portrayed myself with a gag around my mouth. Um, that is one of the works, and, and that's a very well-traveled work. Um, there's a very large commissioned work that I'm very happy with, and it's in a public collection. It's in Cartwright Hall in Bradford, and it's a map of South Asia. It's called Zones of Dreams, and it's actually a, a map which is in mixed media, fairly large work. Um, and I put a lot of myself in it um, because it was for my, for my hopes of South Asia which are hopes that it will be one day uh, an, a region of peace. So that is a work I'm very happy with. That's it's been reproduced. It's a very special work. Yes, it is. And I'm very happy because actually um, two of my students helped me with it. In fact, three of them. Uh, Imran Qureshi did a little bit of, uh, you know, gold uh, on it. I wanted in a corner, I wanted a little bit done, so he did a little bit of work with gold leaf. And then um, Masuma Sayyid and Faiza, who were my former students, I called them one day and I said, you know, a little bit of intricate sort of thing that I want on this side. So both of them came very happily. Um, so I, when I look at that painting, whenever I've been back to Bradford, um, I, I think of the fact that uh, three of my very distinguished students have contributed to this very vast work. I'm very proud of the fact that. That is lucky to have such. That is lucky to have such support and students. Supportive students. And we yeah. have here. And we have here a question. Possibly from I think one of your former possibly from one of your former Amnalia. students, Amnalia. Mm -hmm. Where can we see Sony? Where can we see works? Sony Thirty Works? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, um, I did about four of those. And um, one is in the, um, the permanent collection in, um, in Lahore, uh, which is at Kazafi Stadium. That's a permanent art gallery. It's in a very poor state, unfortunately, because it had a lot of collage. And over this time, because we moved and shunted and kept in not very good conditions, uh, it's lost uh, some of its collage. So I feel rather sad. But it's there at least, so you can see the... I would say the skeleton of that work there. Another one of those is at um, the National Gallery in Islamabad. Again, not kept in very good condition. Also lost some of its collage. One was with Bashir uh, Mirza, and it was destroyed by rainwater. <laughs> so that went. Oh dear. <laughs> that is the story of a lot of art in Pakistan, by the way. <laughs> Um, because we have not really kept work very carefully and the national collections are, you know, there's not very much there, not being kept in very good shape and really needs attention and so. Conservation. Um, Conservation. So, um, yeah, so these, yeah, and there was one more that disappeared and I really don't know where it went. Um, it was bought by a gentleman, a collector in Karachi, who bought a lot of work and then disappeared off to Africa with it, to Nigeria with it, and never came back. Well, hopefully, so it's, Sony well, hopefully it's, it's exhibited for people over there. Perhaps, but this was like 71, so it's a very long time ago. <laughs> yeah. So we have one other question. So we have one other what question. Is what, what is are, next? What are you know, future projects? You know, what future are you projects? Right what are you working on right now? Well, I think that at this moment in time, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you kind of take stock, you wonder, and sometimes dark thoughts come to you about whether there will be something the other side. Um, 
I am. I have recorded my memoirs, wonderful. and um, a very wonderful friend of mine, who is my editor, she is currently editing a lot of material, you know, and she's pulling her hair and doing it. Of course, it will, you know, I shrink it, so a lot of the tapes will just be archival tapes for people who want to listen or do research later, and some of it will become this uh, book, this memoir. Um, I keep referring to my children because I want them to be my judges and what needs to be there and what needs to be chucked out. We have to select photographs to go with it. Um, so that is one project. Um, I continue treasure. to write. That's a treasure. Well, let's see. I hope I don't annoy too many people. I don't think so. But anyway. I don't think you will. <laughs> I don't think you will. <laughs> but um, I'm also. Um, um, you know, doing long standing promises made to people about delivering essays, uh, which I'm slowly doing. I've just delivered two. And I hope this time will give me, um, you know, maybe I'll deliver the two others that are waiting. Um, You're being very I productive. Think that You're being very productive. With, it's been a great struggle. Yeah. I think one of the things that has happened in these three months is one feels that one's mind becomes, you know, a scrambled egg. Um, so it's been a struggle to to stay optimistic, um, to stay productive, labor at the table. Unfortunately, my art materials are not where I am at home. They are. Mm. Uh, in a different space, and I cannot access that space. Um, but perhaps um, after this is over, I would be able to uh, do some of that. And I think I will. I'll probably take time off. And my little notebooks, which I usually add to every summer, I think um, I'll be adding to them um, once this summer is over. Hopefully, it like but it's it such a like dire, such a such a dire time for humanity, and yeah. for the globe. You know, um, you know, one just feels very extremely small and insignificant. Um, it's uh, it's sort of a storm that we are passing through, and we have to be mindful of the extreme suffering that is going on, but also the suffering yet to come. And I think it will be the artists, it will be the writers, it will be the filmmakers, it will be the photographers who will mark this time. And perhaps when this time is over, um, they will assist in making a shift towards a future which is more inclusive yeah, and uh, so. yeah, more, so. more just. It will be more just. Because what important, we have seen now important. is grave, grave injustice.